Hello everyone, the charity of the month this month is Young Lives vs Cancer. The charity helps children and young people and their families find the strength to face whatever cancer throws at them. I really think this is a great cause, so please go and check them out, there's a link to it in the description. I am an office worker, but also an experienced camper. One day, I decided to take off Friday afternoon and go camping for the weekend. There was a nice camping spot about 45 minutes away from me. This was in spring, so many plants were already grown in at this point. When I got there, there were only a couple of other cars in the parking lot, so I figured I'd have a good pick of the spots to camp. There were some good spots that I'd have to hike about a mile to get to, but I didn't mind as the scenery around here was beautiful this time of year. I found a good spot not far from a lake. I figured I could go fishing a little the next day and started setting up my tent. This was a smaller tent made for two people and even though I wouldn't consider myself particularly tall at 5 foot 8, I would still have to lean down quite a bit inside but that didn't matter much as I mainly would only be in it to sleep. As I was setting up, a man and woman came hiking through and said hello and struck up a casual conversation with me. They said they needed to get away for a couple of days too and were in a nearby campsite. A little while after, I decided to go for a hike myself before it got too dark, but I took my flashlight just in case. I hiked about half an hour before turning back when I noticed the flap to my tent was open. I thought I closed it, I said to myself. I didn't see anything missing, so I figured I just forgot to zip it closed. After eating dinner and enjoying the sunset over the lake, I settled in for the night inside the tent. That's when I heard a scream coming from the woods. A woman's scream. I grabbed my knife and my flashlight and investigated nearby as it sounded close, but I couldn't find anything. I thought it could be the couple I met earlier. They said they were camping nearby, so I decided to wait until the morning and go check on them in the light of day. I hiked around but didn't see the couple. All the nearby campsites were empty. I guess something happened that made them cut their trip short. All I found were some footprints, about 10 feet from my tent, of someone who must have been much bigger than me. I know they weren't here when I went to sleep last night, so I got suspicious. I usually take a spare fishing line with me when I go fishing, so I use it to tie the perimeter of my campsite and attach bells to the line. I was leaving tomorrow anyway, so I figured if I could last the night, I'd be fine. I'm not sure what time it was, but in the middle of the night, I heard the sound of a bell. And when I went out to investigate, I saw a man and a woman from when I was setting up, and there were two other people with them now, and all four of them had knives. I panicked and ran away from there, down the path, all I had with me of my knife and flashlight. I turned on my flashlight and hopped into a nearby bush to hide and get them off my tail. I heard them stop and the man from yesterday asked if they saw where I went and that I couldn't have gotten far. He shouted to keep moving down another path. When I didn't hear any more footsteps, I sprinted the rest of the way to my car and booked it out of there. I didn't bother going back to get my stuff because my life was more valuable than a tent and some sleeping bag. I don't know what they were planning. But what I do know is I will never go camping in that area again. This takes place in Northview, West Virginia, during the year of 2021. We recently moved, in case she was wondering. We live on a hill next to an abandoned house. My friend and I would explore the abandoned house all the time since the repairs had stopped and no one was living inside or so we thought. The building had old photos, a really old suitcase and toy cars inside. About a year before, we actually got really interested in that building. We had planned to break the window on the door to unlock it so we could explore it, but I didn't want to get charged with a crime, so I told my friend I wouldn't do it. He ended up breaking the window and unlocking the door, and yes, I know that was stupid, but in the end, karma hit us hard. One night, around 8.50pm, my friend had another kid over at his place. I went to his window and asked them if they wanted to go into the abandoned house with me. 
Without a second thought, they said yes, and we began to make the list of things we would bring and what we'd do when we got inside. I sat out on their porch waiting for them to come out. Keep in mind that I was alone for a good 10 minutes and that we had a bunch of crackheads in our area. A few seconds after waiting, I saw a large guy walking on the road that was down the hill from where I lived. He was screaming, I'll kill that bit, etc. I didn't think anything of it, for I've seen him and people like him before. Later, I saw someone walking towards the abandoned house we planned on exploring. I couldn't see exactly who it was because my house cut off the view of the front door of the abandoned house. I told my friends who came out two minutes later and we went over to investigate, like the typical guys in a horror movie. Once we got to the door, we noticed that the door was locked. Last time we went in, we left the door unlocked. We were all arguing about who should reach their hand in to unlock it. My friend who was recording was trying to get a video of the inside of the building. After arguing, we started to throw sticks in the building to see if we could hear an animal moving because we started to hear what we thought was an animal. After doing that for a bit, we heard someone storming down the stairs. There were about 15 steep short steps. We all screamed and ran. We still have a video of us screaming and running. If you were to watch the video and listen closely, you'd hear the person storming down the steps. So this happened to me when I was 6 years old. I was in my bedroom at around 4.45am. I had to use the bathroom. I got out of bed, however things seemed very weird to me. I noticed that my door was missing. Now I wear glasses because I'm blind, so I just assumed that I couldn't see the door handle. I decided to go to my desk, only to feel around and I felt nothing. My desk was gone. I didn't like this at all. I called out for my mother, but she sadly couldn't hear me. I started to panic because I really had to pee. I went to go back to my bed because normally I have a flashlight under my bed, only my bed was gone too. I noticed that I was in my room but it was empty. At this point I began to cry a little. Remember I'm 6 years old. I was ready to give up and just pee my pants. Until a flashlight came across my window. It was a car beam. I ran over to it and opened the curtains. Once I did that, everything was back to normal. I could see my desk and my bed and my door. The next morning I told my parents about what happened. They gave me a nightlight. To this day, I still haven't had a horrible experience like that. Except I did encounter something else. I'll save that for another time. My mother moved into a new house last year, and it was built in the early 1800s. The house is a little weird, but nothing special. In the house, the kitchen has a door to the living room, and next to that door in the kitchen side is a radiator that is next to the wall. This is important to the story. If you're in the living room, you can see into the kitchen, but not the radiator. So, one day, I was getting on my Oculus Quest 2, and I was making the boundary in the device when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I see the hindquarters of a dog that seemingly walked right into the radiator, but my dog was right next to me. I nearly pooped my pants and went upstairs to think about what I saw. The next time this happened was about a month later, when the same thing happened, with my dog right next to me. Also, my dog will growl into that corner for no reason, which I believe is because of what I saw. Please comment your thoughts of what you think this is, because I can't think of any explanation myself. I only very recently recalled this memory, as I forgot it even happened to me. Prior to this incident, I had never experienced anything like it nor did I suffer from any hallucinations, not even after the fact. This is the only time I experienced something visual. I have had a couple of audible experiences since then, but nothing visual and undeniably real like this. It could have been explainable, but I haven't been able to figure out how. Maybe you will. I live in Hawaii on the island of Kauai, and I'm a 28 year old female. 
approximately 20 years ago, I was on the island of Oahu, visiting family on my father's side. I stayed at my auntie's house with her rather large, high and width-wise Samoan boyfriend. She was about 5 foot and was on the chunky side. She has a daughter, my cousin, who was the same age as me and standing at an average 8 year old girl's height. You'll see why this information matters. They lived in this neighbourhood called Wilhelmina Rise on the bottom floor of a two story house. It was set up almost like a fairly spacious studio where the only room was the bathroom. Otherwise you could see everything in the studio in its entirety no matter where you were standing. There were two queen size beds several feet from each other. One closest to the TV and the other closest to the back wall. I was sleeping in the bed furthest from the TV, on the inside, having the wall closest to me, and my cousin was sleeping next to me on the outside. My auntie and her boyfriend were of course sleeping in the other bed. I want to say it was somewhere between 1 and 2am when I suddenly woke up. I don't know if I had to use the bathroom or what disrupted me, but I was facing the kitchen when I opened my eyes. Again, yes. Everything was one big room, so I could see the kitchen, microwave, front door, etc. from my position. So I opened my eyes and propped myself up a bit, using my elbow to see over my peacefully slumbering cousin. I was puzzled at first as it caught my eye, and I thought, I'm just imagining things, as I began to rub my eyes and hoping to be rid of whatever was causing this potential illusion. I look up again, knowing it would be gone because the explanation was my eyes were just likely blurry caused me to see imaginary things, right? That's what everyone else would expect when something like this happens to someone. But that isn't what happened, not in this universe. After rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I look up again and it's in the same spot as it had been. The next step is to pinch yourself, right? That's exactly what I did. Pinch, pinch, pinch on my arm as hard as I could. To where I had to rub the pain away as it was still there. My eight-year-old mind was trying to make sense of what was playing out, but I couldn't. And I think that maybe that's why I didn't say anything to anyone until very, very recently. Standing in the kitchen facing the sink, away from me, was what looked to be a male figure on the slimmer side. Except I couldn't see any details of it. It was as if it were encompassed by a dark, deep, shadowy black. It was a silhouette. Not even the stove's dim overhead light penetrated anything on it. Other than this entire encounter, the odd thing is when I saw it, my half-asleep brain recognised it as my grandma until I looked harder and made sense where it actually was. But that didn't make sense for a lot of reasons. The main two being that she's my mum's mum, therefore having no relation to anyone here except me. And two, she was still alive and well on my home island at the time. She didn't pass away until about a decade later, so it wasn't some sort of omen, I don't think. After I looked at my auntie and her enormous boyfriend sleeping as they're supposed to be, I glanced at the front door thinking maybe someone broke in. From where I was, I could see the chain was still on the door, as was the heavy duty padlock, meaning the only way the locked door's opening is from the inside. The only window in her place was still intact as well. I was quickly checking explanations off the list and not liking the conclusion I was coming to. My heart was pounding at this point, as the figure still hadn't made a single movement. I rubbed my eyes and pinched myself one last time, hoping I was dreaming. Please, I thought to myself, as I slowly started to lower my body onto my mattress, keeping my eyes on whatever it was that refused to go away. Please keep us safe and don't let anyone see anything. I stealthily flipped on my side to face the wall and pulled my covers over my head. I didn't care how hot it was. I was not going to see what was on the other side of this thing, nor was I going to feel, hear, anything it does. I suddenly prayed more to my parents' God and had so much fear and adrenaline coursing through me. I thought that I would never end up falling asleep. I generally had it in my mind that something was about to happen to me. Miracles do happen, as after a millennia had passed, I did indeed fall asleep through the rest of the night without any further disturbances. I don't recall what happened the following day, but all I know is nothing was out of place, 
no evidence of someone MacGyvering their way into the house, and no one else mentioned anything about what I saw. I did tell my dad's mum about this recently, and she genuinely believes I'm sensitive to anything spiritual or paranormal. She has her reasons, but that's another story. For some reason, I haven't been able to find it in me to agree with her about being sensitive. Maybe it's because I fear these type of encounters, so I consciously shut this stuff out. Maybe because I'm just too sceptical. All I do know is that I'd like to never experience seeing a spooky, spectral stranger in the middle of the night ever again. Around the age of 15, my cousin A, 16, a couple of friends and I had recently gotten into visiting haunted places. There was a very well known cemetery around where I lived, probably about 30 miles away. It's dusk when I have to leave the house, so that we could arrive at the location at night, but not stay so late that our parents would be worried about our well-being. It's important to know that this cemetery was majority, if not all, soldiers from the Civil War. We travelled down a small dirt road blasting music, talking about all the things we was going to do when we leave our small town. We finally make it to the graveyard with no crazy stuff happening. We weren't expecting anything to happen either. We were about to let our parents know that we made it safely. However, there is absolutely no phone service. When we parked, my cousin A and our two friends who were sisters, E and L, and a few years older than us, are discussing who is going to get out first. Elle and I decide that we're standing in the car because we wanted to, jokingly, use them as guinea pigs. While we sit in the car, my cousin E walked casually into the graveyard. Elle and I are joking around, saying that we'll stick together and survive, but that's when things started to get real. Boom, boom. The sound of bass coming from nowhere. Elle asked if I can hear it too, but of course, I'm a type of person to rule every scenario out because I resort to something being supernatural. I tell Elle that it's probably just a car on the road. Elle then reminds me that we're in the middle of the woods, in a very low populated town with no one else around. We hear it again, almost in perfectly timed intervals. She asks me, this is a civil war cemetery right? And this is when we realise that maybe it was some type of drum. I become startled, I called for A and E to please come back to the car. They came back and we explain what we heard. They believe us, but before we left, they wanted to take pictures. Again, this is in complete darkness, with nothing but our car headlights on for vision. We take pictures in front of the car, and then go through the phone to make sure we had the ones that was up to par. In the pictures were shining boards of light, so much so that it looked like it was snowing. Now we're in a huge rush to get out of there. A and E jump in the car and we drive away as quickly as possible, discussing possibilities for the camera on the phone to show up balls of light. We're reviewing the pictures, and we then receive a voicemail. It's definitely one of our parents, I think to myself. We did not have any service to call them when we arrived, and now they are very worried. I honestly wish it was one of our parents yelling at us, telling us that we were grounded, or that they were so worried. But what followed was so much worse. We could barely hear anything, but we hooked it up to the orcs and turned up the volume. It was us, talking, our entire conversation from before we were going to take the pictures to when we drove away. We still aren't sure exactly what caused any of these things, but we never went to another graveyard after that. This happened about four years ago. I was 20 at the time. The first time I met the guy who had become my grocery store stalker, he was standing outside the store collecting money for the Salvation Army at Christmas time for donations. I'm a fairly friendly person, so I like to say hi to people who work at places I frequent to be nice. This guy was a kid around my age, very tall, with a mild resemblance to Lurch from the Adams family. Dark circles under dark eyes, short black hair, kind of a vacant look in his eyes. 
I chatted with him for maybe two minutes, just idle chit chat about the weather and whatnot. Nothing really particularly memorable or interesting. And then I waved goodbye and went home. Little did I know that that single moment would be the start of something that would have me genuinely afraid. About four or five months passed and I hadn't seen him again. Then one day, as I was grocery shopping with a friend, when we were just chit-chatting, she suddenly got really quiet and kind of recalled backwards. Looking behind me, I turned to see this guy, who had to be at least 6'4", towering over me, not 8 inches from my body. He said hi, and told me he remembered me from that December I talked to him, and then he asked for my number. I, being young and never having experienced this type of interaction before, told him I didn't have my number memorized, but I would write down his number and text him later. I kind of waved my phone at him, pointing out my at the time boyfriend, whose picture was my wallpaper, making a point to say, oh look, that's my boyfriend, to the guy, hoping he would kind of clue in, but no luck. He told me his number, which immediately upon getting I blocked, without letting him get my phone number. However, what really made my blood run cold was what he said after I put my phone away. He leaned in real close in a low voice and told me, whatever I text you is only for your eyes. At this point, I started to feel genuinely uncomfortable. I said, um, yeah, sure, nice talking to you, but we gotta go back to shop him. And I grabbed my friend and dragged her off, shooting a panicked look at her and asking why she didn't bail me out. Apparently, he scared her too with his getting so close to me, and she didn't know what to do. I want to make it clear, I'm not exactly a small girl. I'm 5'8 and solidly built. I can certainly handle myself, and I very rarely feel intimidated or small in the presence of anyone, male or female. But this guy genuinely made me feel tiny and scared. In the months to follow, he would make me feel truly frightened. I hoped that the creepy interaction would be the last time I saw him, but that unfortunately wasn't the case. After that initial meeting with him, saying that creepy thing about his text for being my eyes only, it seemed like I would run into him every single time I got to the store. No matter what checkout lane I was in, he always seemed to appear at the end of it when I was finishing shopping. And every time I was in the store, I would notice him out the corner of my eye watching me, no matter what area I was in. One time, I even caught him following me out of the car. At that point, I got scared and decided to say something to the managers. After letting the managers know what was going on, they assured me they would tell him not to talk to me. After that, he wouldn't speak to me, but I would continue to see him following me around the store at a distance every time I went up there. It got so bad, and I felt so frightened that I started to be afraid to go to the store at all. But I am one of those stubborn people who refuses to be intimidated by someone to the point where I'll stop doing something. I would hoped that it was maybe a coincidence that he had followed me. After all, it was a big store, and maybe he just had things to do that just happened to be in the areas I was shopping in. So I started to pay close attention to my surroundings. Once I started really paying attention, I realised that every single time I was up there, I would constantly notice him in the areas of the store I was in. During my last encounter with him, I went to the store to grab just two or three items I needed for dinner that night, and I saw him standing outside the store when I got there. And with his back to me, I quickly ran inside, hoping he didn't see me. Unfortunately, a few minutes later I saw him at the very back of the store, and the items in hand. I immediately made a beeline towards the front. As soon as I got into the checkout, I dug behind one of the shelf displays, and watched carefully at the front of the store to see if CC would appear. And he did. I just watched as he looked up and down the checkout, and when he didn't see me there, I saw him step outside. At this point, I quickly ran into the nearest open cashier, rang up my items, and stuck my head out the door to look for him. I didn't see him there immediately, so I started trying to make my way back to where I was parked. I'd parked a ways away, near the side of the store where a bunch of other small stores and restaurants were lined up, and as I was walking towards my car, I realised I saw him standing by the entrance I had first entered the store through, and ducked behind a pillar immediately, hoping he didn't see me. I watched carefully from behind the pillar, as he scanned the parking lot, he obviously couldn't find me. After a minute or two, he started to walk out towards the direction of the parking lot in front of the store, so I took the opportunity to make a run for it to my car as soon as he was far enough away that I felt safe. As soon as I got into my car and locked the doors, and to my horror, when I looked up, he was standing there, about 15 feet from my car with a shopping cart in front of him. I knew he followed me. He knew I knew. 
I fully believed he had chased me, and when I made it to the car, he grabbed the nearest thing to make it look like he was collecting from the parking lot. I remember just feeling absolutely terrified at that moment. I went home and immediately told my grandfather what happened. I began crying and shaking, and my grandfather told me to get in the car and we were going to settle this. He and I drove up to the store in his car and walked into the store and demanded we spoke with the managers immediately, both of them. When the managers arrived at customer service, he asked me to tell them what had been happening and demanded that they ensure that he left me alone or he'd involve the police. The manager swore up and down to take care of it. As far as I know, he wasn't fired immediately because a friend who first encountered him with me when this whole thing began told me that she would see him from time to time when she was there by herself, but that any time I went with her, she would never see him. I fully believe he knew wherever I was there, only this time instead of stalking me, he avoided me. Eventually everyone who knew the situation stopped seeing him there, so I think he may have gotten fired or moved from that store. Either way, I haven't had any issues since. But I've never been so afraid in my life of another human being as I was that day seeing him make eye contact with me in the parking lot as I locked my car doors. It still creeps me out to think he was watching me so closely every time I entered the store and he could so easily avoid or follow me whenever he wanted. All of this happened when I was a kid, maybe five or six years old. I was living in a small two bedroom apartment with my mum, dad and my younger brother. Our apartment was located on the first floor of a four story building. I was sleeping in a small bedroom with my brother, who was three or four at the time. My parents room was right next to ours. The living room was across the hallway and had a small balcony which faced the courtyard of the building. It wasn't the best part of town, but a very safe city where crimes very rarely ever took place. Still, my parents were cautious and always closed and locked all of the doors. One night, I still remember very vividly, I woke up because I heard somebody walking around. I saw a dark figure standing in the middle of the room. At first, I thought it was my mum taking my brother back to his bed, as he still often went to their room when he had nightmares. But then I realised my brother was sleeping safe and sound, as I could hear him breathing slowly and calmly. Also, the figure was bigger and wider than my mum. Since it was so dark in the room, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. In fact, I wasn't even sure if it was a real person or just a shadow. In the past, I'd often had trouble sleeping at night because I believed the shadows in my rooms were monsters staring at me. My mother always told me that if I closed my eyes, they couldn't hurt me, and so I closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. After a little time, I want to say a few minutes, but it may have just been a few seconds, my brother woke up and started crying. He got up and ran into my parents' bedroom. I kept laying still in my bed, closed my eyes so the shadows would go away. The next thing I remember is waking up in the morning as if nothing had ever happened. Now you could easily just brush this off as a kid having a nightmare, but hear me out. Here's where it gets creepy. At breakfast, my brother couldn't stop talking about the men he saw. The men who were watching us. My father told him to stop talking such nonsense until I said I saw the man too. Now my father got a bit angry saying that if we kept talking about scary stories like this, we'd have trouble falling asleep at night. But my mum started freaking out. She said that in the middle of the night, she too woke up to a strange noise. She looked up and saw a man standing in the doorway. When she reached over to get her glasses and take a better look at the man, he was gone. She also thought it was just a shadow. A few moments later, my brother came running into a room. We immediately locked all the doors and windows. The main door was locked. However, we discovered the balcony door unlocked. My parents checked our belongings, every valuable item we had, but nothing was missing. Everything was exactly the way it was the evening before. We reported the incident to the police, but they weren't able to find any signs of a break-in. No fingerprints, nothing. My parents must have forgotten to lock the balcony door the night before. Needless to say, none of us slept well for the next couple of nights. Thankfully, this was the only time these men ever came to our house. The fact that nothing had been taken always makes it feel even creepier to me. With burglars, at least you know they're after your stuff and not you, right? So, to the strange men watching me sleep, I sincerely hope we never meet you again. Hello everyone, before I start this story, I just want to apologise if you can hear any walking in the background. I can't get my dog to sit still and he's been walking around for like 3 hours straight now and he just wants it. So if you hear anything then I apologise, it's Stanley. Anyway, on with the story. 
A few years ago, I was on a dating site where I matched with a police officer. I thought his dog was cute and figured this was my opportunity to finally get to pet a canine police dog. I was quickly disinterested after listening to him complain about his recent divorce. I don't recall the details, but I remember it was very apparent that he was a problematic person in that relationship. I was also really grossed out by how he fetishized me for my big sloppers, tattoos and colourful hair. I was very upfront and told him I wasn't interested and that he was setting off some red flags for me. He begged me to give him a chance, but I said no and blocked his number. A few days later, I get a knock on my door around midnight. My heart dropped into my butt. It startled me so much. I look out my peephole and see a stranger holding food. It's an Uber Eats delivery driver. I tell him through the door that I didn't order food, but he said someone ordered it and he knew my name. I asked who ordered it and he said a name that I didn't recognise. I tell him I don't want the food and give him directions to the dumpster to throw the food in, because at this point I don't have any clue if this guy's actually from Uber. Later on, I'm going through my dating app matches and realise it was a cop's name. I go through my blocked messages and this guy texts me a lot. The last text was, I hope you like your dinner. I decided it's best to unblock this man so I can keep an eye on what he's saying in case I need to be worried about my safety or if I'm going to need to buy some bear maze to drop a cop. A few weeks later I'm at work, I'm a hairstylist and I get a call from a number I don't recognise. I answer because I assume it's a new client. The voice on the other line says, hey Rachel, I'm from Starbucks across the street, what's your drink order? I asked, who's this? I don't have you in my appointment book assuming it's a regular and I've made a scheduling error. He says the name again and my heart dropped into my butt. How does he know where I work? I ask him how he knows where I live and work, and he explains that he did a reverse image search on the photos from my dating profile, found my social media and my Yelp page from my salon, and then looked up your address line from there. I tell him I'm calling his station and reporting him for stalking, and if he ever comes near me, I'll consider it a threat and will be ready to physically defend myself. After all that, he still begs me to give him a chance. I hang up, call this police station he works at, in a very small town, and complain. They won't even let me email screenshots my creepy texts. I could tell nothing would be done. The lady literally said, Oh, sorry. He's going through a lot right now, and literally treated him like he was a victim. He mostly left me alone after that, but I was so scared living alone for the first time in my life. I have a semi-popular meme page on Instagram with about 8,000 followers. I sifted through and found like 5 of his accounts, I blocked them and moved on. This was several years ago, but all these memories came flooding back when I noticed a familiar profile on the account who commented a post. This was several years ago, but all these memories came flooding back when I noticed a familiar profile photo on an account who commented on a post. I must have missed an account of his when I was blocking. I had posted a photo of me holding two big tuners I caught fishing. And he commented, God, I wish I was one of those fish. I'd love to know what it's like to be held by you. Bath. This is going to take a while to explain everything, so stay with me. It all comes around. My very first car was a dark green 2000 Volkswagen Jetta. It was the most basic of basics when it came to cars. No options whatsoever, except for an automatic transmission. It was $300, slow, dumpy, no right headlight, drove straight with the steering wheel particularly sideways, let out a cloud of white smoke and started. Every stereotype of a poor high schooler's car you can think of, my car was no exception. Despite it being a piece of German crap, I loved that car. I drove it every time I had a chance. I don't think a day went by I didn't drive it. I named it Thunder Bunny, she was my baby, my beautiful green baby, but Volkswagens from that generation, Jettas especially, had a pretty bad flaw in the automatic transmission. I'm not sure exactly what causes it, but essentially the transmission gradually gets worse and worse until the car will not shift into third gear, and there's not a thing you can do from there. So a couple of weeks after Halloween 2019, I was going about 30 miles per hour when the engine suddenly roared and the car wouldn't speed up. I feared the worst, and my fears were justified. My dad, a mechanic, didn't even have a hope for my baby. She was gone already, and so much to my dismay, we started looking for a new car. It only took about a month for us to find her, 
a dark green 1999 Volkswagen Jetta. Exactly like my old car, but absolutely everything. She was faster, had heated leather seats, auto windows, auto sunroof, everything. All except for an automatic transmission. I knew how to drive manual, so it was perfect. I had a new baby. From the crackhead neighbour girl to Scarlett Johansson. At least in my eyes. I loved that car even harder. I named it Little Boy and was happy. Okay, so now onto the story. But I have a few more quick things to explain. You can skip this if you want, but it's important but not vital to the story. First is for people that might not know, but when you have a manual car, you cannot leave it in gear and take your foot off the clutch. If you do, the car will stall, which is bad. So if you do leave your car in gear, you need to turn off the engine before taking your foot off the clutch. If you don't want to turn the car off or have it turn itself off, you need to pull the handbrake or it will roll away. Guess what the only really broken thing in my car was at that point this story takes place. If you guessed it, you're right. And it was the second thing, no handbrake. Okay, so now onto the story. I started working at a pizza delivery in a smaller, growing town in Michigan. It was good money, but every once in a while I delivered to an incredibly sketchy place, and have had a few shotguns pulled on me. One night, around two months ago, I was delivering on Friday. Usually Fridays are very busy, but this day was a little slow. So when a delivery came in at 8.30, a half an hour before we were closed, I jumped on it. I realised it was 7.1 miles away, so all of the closing jobs would be done by the time I got back, and I would have been able to leave immediately. It was a way out of town in a woods surrounding neighbourhood. But again, no work when I got back to the store. Seemed like a good deal to me, and I'm all about them sort of deals. And so I climbed into my car and went to drive 7.1 miles away. As I pulled up to the house, I began to get a bad feeling. The house was in a small trailer park type neighbourhood next to a lake. The kind that the houses are all a good distance apart with likely a drug problem, and it was completely dark. No lights inside and no lights outside. There was a single car in the driveway and an open window on the side of the house. I pulled in behind the car in the driveway and sat there for a moment. Something was off. By the house being completely dark, I mean there wasn't so much as a nightlight that I could see. Usually when I deliver to a dark house, there's at least a light on the upstairs or something that would signal someone being awake, waiting for their pizza. But the house seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put the car into gear, turned the engine off, and grabbed the small, cheapest pizza we had got out. Without my headlights on, there was nothing. I could barely see the house. The only light was from the dim moon. I walked onto the porch and passed a big open window with the front door. As I reached for the front door, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open, just enough for me to see the void of the house. Thinking of every single horror movie I've ever seen, I said aloud, F that, and hurried back to my car. I'm a tall, well-built looking guy, but despite my wide shoulders and baggy hoodie, I'm a frail thing, and I could hardly fight off a small dog. I got into my car and turned on the engine. My headlights illuminated the house, and almost simultaneously the living room light behind the big open window lit up and a single guy looked out and walked to the front door. I cussed myself and weighed my options. If I went up to the front door, I could die. If I noped out of there, I would 110% be fired. That meant no new car part, no gas money, no cute dates with my girl, just sitting at home doing my virtual schoolwork. It was a stupid choice I know, but I grabbed the pizza and opened my door, making a choice I'm damn glad I made. I took the car out of gear and climbed out, mostly so the engine would still be running so that if I needed, I could run back and immediately take off. I walked to the door where the man had opened it the rest of the way. As I got closer, I got a good look at him. I'm not one to judge a person based on their physical appearance, but this guy's head was cleanly shaven and was covered in tattoos. He was wearing a grey pair of jeans and a white tank top. He had a scowl on his face and was staring at me dead in the eyes. I looked past him for a moment into the house, which was completely empty. As I got close enough, I started opening the pizza bag. He then started to reach around his waist. I stopped. He was staring at me with the most evil grin I've ever seen. In that moment, I knew I was about to die. I've always heard your life seems to flash before your eyes. I thought about my girl, that she wouldn't know what happened. My work would stop delivering upon my disappearance, assuming my body was never found. My dad would regret telling me that he was happy for me for landing this job. God save thee. That's when I heard it. A distinct sound of gravel under tyres. My only pathetically small chance of an escape was rolling away. I didn't even look back at the car to know that. 
I just stared at the man and was about to say F you when he looked back to my car. I heard the sound of the cars rolling and it was getting closer. The guy's eyes went from the driveway to behind me. I finally looked over my shoulder. My car had rolled backwards and had come to a stop near the mailbox of the house. I looked back at the guy who had a nervous look. He looked back at me and scowled again and took his hand from around his waist. He reached into his front pocket and took out $12 and handed it to me. I gave him the pizza and watched him slam the door shut. I ran back to my car and practically tore off the door trying to get in. I looked back at the house and the man was standing in front of the windows staring out at me. You better believe I nearly spun the tires on my way out of there. I kept glancing at my mirrors until I started driving under the streetlights. It was easily the scariest moment I've ever had. As soon as I got back to the store, I told my boss about it and she called the police. We never heard anything about it. I assumed they went to the house and only found a small cheese pizza. I started carrying a knife on me at all times and my boss is considering getting trackers for our pizza bags. Only recently, I realised this sort of thing is a butterfly effect. I thought it was the worst thing ever that my transmission went out and I cursed Volkswagen for designing such a terrible automatic system. But if that transmission was still working, then I would have still had that car when this happened. I would have put the car into park and it would have sat there while whatever happened, happened. I have zero doubts in my mind that man was planning on murdering me. So crappy German engineering saved me from getting murdered. Edit. I'm assuming that when my car began to roll, the guy assumed that there was someone inside, backing up to pick me up maybe. The engine wasn't revving, but if you're about to murder a person, you probably don't focus on those details. Sorry for any confusion. Okay, this happened probably around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been like 11. I'm 30 now. Anyway, I lived in a new area. A lot of houses, etc. were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful houses, despite being a terrible area I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we go around the corner from my house, down where they are building a bunch of houses. It's pretty dark, I'd probably say about 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. Anyway, we're walking past houses that look pretty much finished. We're chatting, and a guy randomly shows up out of the loo behind us, grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified and runs away crying and climbs over a fence, completely ditches me. This guy is very casual despite being creepy and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a provi, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him just to be like, you shouldn't be here at night whilst we're patrolling the streets etc. But suddenly we go to a house which isn't completely built yet, and no one lives in it. Well I think. I'm literally standing inside this basement looking house whilst he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling the cops, the conversation sounds fake, and he just sounds like he's trying to scare me, and he is. I get really freaked out now though, cause upstairs there's like this constant tapping sound and it can't be a builder by himself at like 11pm surely. It sounds like someone's locked in something trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound, as if they knew I was in the house. It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly he's off the phone and he's like, okay the cops are coming to your house soon, leave now. I'm thinking, nah not really. I didn't give you my address. But at the same time, I was freaking out because maybe this guy knows the streets and where I live. So that entire night, I was just like looking out my window hoping no cops would come. They didn't in the end and obviously did all of this just to scare me. But why? This situation for me is scary because a guy randomly grabbing a hold of you in the street in pitch black darkness is freaky regardless of whether or not it's a building site. And I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door, had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered like, why was he there? What was he doing? Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area unless I had someone with me. 
Truth be told, there are a lot of issues in the area, and I'm guessing that guy and a bunch of other guys were acting like undercover cops since they weren't usually comfortable coming to where I lived since they'd usually get bricked. It comes from the troubles. Looking back though, I think the entrance was blocked off and we weren't actually allowed in there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed that this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad. I appreciate the feedback guys, considering this is my first story on here. For me, because the guy showed up and being in the house etc, things happened for the sake of 5-7 to seven minutes. It was hard to fully digest what was going on and reminded me a little bit of the film audition. Obviously, nowhere near as freaky, but the sound upstairs was similar to the guy in the scene from the audition. If you've watched the film, you'll know what I mean. When my friend and I met the woman we now refer to as the Banshee, it was about 10 at night. We were walking back from a milk tea place and we were maybe at mile 5 of a 6 mile total round trip, almost home. We were walking on a long stretch of sidewalk next to a wide road that is busy during the day but almost empty at night. A little background, my hiking buddy and I sometimes go for long walks through the town at night when we can't get to the trails during the day. It's dark, but our route goes through a fairly safe and blend of residential and shopping areas. Usually, we head to some sort of late night restaurant or food truck. We walk, stop for food and drink, and then head back. We wear glowing vests, battery powered, and reflective stuff to make sure traffic sees us because we've had some too close encounters with distracted drivers. We've also had a few encounters with strange people. She didn't start making strange noises at first. It was a long stretch of straight sidewalk and we had seen her coming for a long time before she started that. No one else was out walking along the road at this hour. There were plenty of street lights. She'd appear under the lights and disappear in some shadow of bushes and trees and then reappear under the lights. We were glowing in our vests in addition to the street lights so she'd have to have seen us coming. I figured she just worked at one of the shops or restaurants nearby and was getting done with closing up. I figured she was just trying to get home, just like we were, until she started making these random noises. The first sound was like an odd hacking noise, like she was attempting to clear her throat as noisily as possible, but this was just a warm up. The sound then changed to something like a cross between a crow cawing and a small dog's bark, rendering text is hard but the closest thing might be a grawl. So we kept walking towards her, watching and listening, thinking perhaps she had a disability or some other issue. She looked decently dressed and she walked steadily and deliberately, not like someone on drugs. If not her noises, she seemed completely normal. Then she made these loud but low pitched groaning sounds, something like a mmm sort of noise. It had us briefly making zombie movie references, joking a bit, but we speculated if she was maybe talking to someone on earbuds or making an attempt at singing something, but it got weirder as she added some higher pitched screechy sounds. Something like an angry cockatoo might make, like a cra cra sound. At this point, she's less than two blocks away and she's rotating through these bizarre sounds with sort of pauses of silence between. She looks like someone's cute little grandma. She didn't look like anything you'd expect to see making those sounds. She's wearing an old fashioned thick skirt, a cardigan and chunky looking shoes, carrying a single cloth shopping bag. Her hair is a short curly old lady perm. She looks adorable. She sounds insane. Gra, crow bark sound. Mram, zombie noise. Ka, ka, cockatoo shriek sound. She's getting closer. Her bizarre noises are getting more unsettling, and I realise I can't see what she's clutching in her hand. The one that doesn't have the shopping bag. She looks harmless, but the sounds are too weird. My buddy looks at me and asks, Time to cross? Echoing my own thoughts. We didn't want a confrontation with this lady. I nodded, but just before we step out into the road, the lady seems to have the same idea. 
She suddenly veered off to the sidewalk and went into the road, making a steady diagonal line towards the other side. There was no traffic on the road at this point, so I wasn't worried. I relaxed a bit, continuing on. I figured she was avoiding us, just like we were about to avoid her. But just as we started to pass her, she suddenly screamed and rushed at us in the middle of the road. Her mouth was wide open as she charged at us, just shrieking. We stepped quickly apart, and her abrupt rush took her right between us. Just shriek wailing that horrible sound. It sounded like it would hurt her throat. Banshee-like is the only word I have for it. We were several feet apart. Both braced for her to come back and do something. But instead, she veered again and went down the sidewalk the way she had originally been going. As she walked away, she kept looking back at us and keeping up short bursts of shrieking banshee noise, stopping to take breaths. As she got further away from us, she started core barking at us again. We stood there for a while, just silently watching until she was a good long ways down the sidewalk with her very strange crow barking fading into the distance. I still have no idea what was wrong with her. Did our light somehow trigger an episode? I hope she's okay. She seemed to know where she was going, but Banshee Lady, let's not meet again. So, I take my dad's ashes up to Glacier National Park every year. I lived in Colorado when the story happened, and I was headed south through Idaho after I had visited Montana. My car broke down in Salmon, Idaho, and a really nice man helped me out. I was headed through the mountains to Boise to visit a friend. It was about a five hour drive before I entered the truly mountainous section of Idaho. I saw a hot spring on the side of this two lane highway along the Salmon River. I decided to take a dip after the stress of having my car breaking down. The hot spring had a bathhouse up at the top near the road, and a wheelchair ramp that went down to the area near the springs where they were on the other side of the river. People had created little bath shaped sections in the river that were separated by river stones. Actually, you could sit in a spot that was shaped like a hot tub so that it held the water from the hot springs while the river rushed over it. I got out of my car and headed down the hot spring. I took my dog with me. It was twilight, about every half hour a car passed by. Knowing that I was alone essentially, I took my top off. I was sitting in the hot spring and actually took a photo of a car approaching. The car pulled up next to mine in front of the bathhouse. It was a truck with three men in it. Seamlessly, one of the men got out of the driver's side and two men got out of the passenger side. They moved without qualms and were covered in heavy black gear. They looked like hunters. I couldn't see the expressions on their face. The driver headed down the wheelchair ramp towards me, not hesitating. He took big long strides. I recognised that there was danger. The two passengers from the other side of the car headed down towards a steep bank along the wheelchair ramp, taking a shortcut. I was stuck in between both parties. Hastening, I hid and dressed myself under the water while my dog growled. He never growls. I've only ever heard him growl twice all my life, and this was the second time. The driver kept on walking towards me. He walked out onto the rocks into the river, continuously walking towards me even though he was covered in heavy gear that could get him waterlogged if he fell in the river. The other two passengers from the side of the car were also walking out on the rocks, directly in front of me. The driver got so close that I had to grab my dog before he lashed out at the driver. I was freaking out. The man was walking out onto the stones so that he could reach me. He was not hesitating. I couldn't see his face. I grabbed my phone, my keys, my clothes. I dragged my dog in between the two parties, my heart in ears. The driver would not stop. He turned around very quickly, making an arc, coming for me still. He was still taking big strides. The passengers were walking towards me as well. I was trapped in between them. I ran up the bank, dragging my dog pretty much by his collar all the way into my car. The only way that I could get into my car without them grabbing me was by throwing my dog into the back and lunging myself into the passenger side door of my car. I threw my keys into the ignition and turned them when the men were walking up between my car and their car. I happened to hit the lock button on the door right when they walked up. Before anything else happened, or before I saw their faces, 
I ended up throwing myself into the driver's seat and reversing my car and hightailing it out of there. I drove to about 20 minutes down the road. I crossed a river on a bridge and hid my car behind a bank near the other campers. It was well hidden from the main road. The campers were looking at me and wondering what was going on. I sat, I waited. Another 10 minutes passed by and lo and behold the truck drove by. The hunters were looking for me. I managed to wait another half an hour and then drove up to the mountains, over to Boyce and into safety. Sorry ahead of time for any format issues, I'm posting this on a cell phone. So for context, I'm a 22 year old male and I live in a large city in the midwest. Now I drive Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I drive for other similar companies, but that's besides the point. I have many horror stories from all those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out running Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mum's with my new baby and wife. Nothing special going on for the night, just the usual. I get a ride request. It was a pickup from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive and I find my passenger. He has all his belongings, several boxes and stuff. Now my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not too big. We get all this stuff loaded up, barely, and on our way. During the ride he's crying, saying that his girlfriend was cheating on him, and he had walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because it was her name on the lease. So I was taking him to a hotel. Now in my city we have a street that is known for having vices, hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons and shady motels, the works. We get to the motel and he asks me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem man, I say. I'll confess, I break the rules a little when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being, driving Lyft and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me, as well as people who've tried to fight me, rob me, and all kinds of other things. But like I said, another time. This motel was on a street I mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed out against a building. I'm a big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm on edge. He gets his key. The whole motel is ground level. So, to help the guy out, I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he has a lot of stuff, so I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip of getting stuff, I saw a guy come out of a room just to the south of my car, followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to, not my passenger. One of the ladies pounded on the door then opened it. That's when I saw a guy raise a shotgun up out of his long coat and storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, slamming the door behind them. Following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this man. Go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas. And he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice he took boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill into my pocket. I knew what may have been going on down in that room. I had to leave, or at least get to where I could get my gun. I know the guy and the ladies saw me, and I know they knew I saw the gun. I had to get out of there, you know, no witnesses. I got in my car and sped away quickly. I got a block or so away and called the cops. I hand them every detail. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed out a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night, the cops investigated. They never found the gunman or the woman. They never answered the door I saw them come out of and the occupants of the room they went into said nothing happened, and that I was full of shit. Well, I know what I saw. So, back in November 2020, I was in and out of hospital with testicular torsion eight times altogether, because why permanently fix a medical issue when you can temporarily fix it, I guess? And on my last time at one of the hospitals, I called a taxi to go home, but it would take about 30 to 40 minutes to get to me because it was a Saturday in the city. Since there was going to be a bit of a wait, 
I decided to sit down in a garden slash bench area in front of the hospital. It was 3am, about 0 degrees celsius, and I had been awake for 36 hours at that point. My taxi was on its way, and I just sat cross-legged on the bench, headphones on and nicotine keeping me alive. Everything was fine until after 10 minutes. I noticed a guy very clearly walking directly towards me. He was stumbling a bit, so I assumed he was drunk, and he got level with me. He stopped right in front of me and said something that I didn't hear. I looked up and said, what? Sorry, I had music on. As I pulled them off, he looked at me dead in the eye and just said, I could F him back at you right now. Of everything I was expecting him to say, that wasn't on the list. So, caught off guard, I tried to summon him with humour by saying, I don't doubt it. Which did work, thank god, because he would have absolutely pulled me into the ground. And every time I said something similar, he'd just say, I could batter you. I want to deck you right here, right now. And I could take you in a fight. Just to recall a few of them. After his anger toned down, he sat on the bench next to me and started generally drunk rambling about his family and his friends, and very specifically, his best friend's girlfriend that he was having an affair with. Then he pointed out my shoes, saying, Those are nice, mate. Can I have them? Obviously, I said no firmly, but not aggressively. Then said thanks and told him about the fact that I've got them on the sale. He said, Can I touch them? Which was immediately a big red flag. I politely declined, and he started rubbing my shoe anyway. I was still sitting cross-legged on the bench. Then, in one swift movement, he grabbed my ankle, pulled my entire leg up to his face, and put the entire toe of my size 11 Converse's in his mouth. At which point, while sitting in stunned silence, I started desperately looking around, and I could see the hospital police walking over. The officer asked if we were here together. He said yes, I said no. The officer then asked if he was a patient, I said yes, he said no. I told the officer I was just waiting for my taxi, and the guy rambled something I couldn't really make out to the officer, who suggested he move along. The guy stood up, gave me a handshake, and walked off into the night. The officer obviously asked if I was okay, and I told him what happened. He was just as confused as I was. After that, my taxi was due in five minutes, so I went and stood on the opposite side of the hospital to where the taxi rank was. I asked some friends, who are familiar with a lot of drugs, and what he could have been on, and they all unanimously said meth, and the shoe thing was probably just a fetish. Random shoe butter outside the hospital. <laughs> Let's never meet again. This took place around the corner from my house when I was about 7-10 to 10 years old. There was a food place around the corner, and I'd run around to get their milkshakes every now and then. One day, my parents left to go out somewhere, just as the sun was about to set. I called my mum to tell her I'd be leaving around the corner, and she said it was fine. The previous day, I'd gotten a deep bruise on my arm from school, and I was wearing a t-shirt that day, as it was just turning summer. I didn't know how to tie shoelaces back then, so I just thought I'd leave them untied for the moment. I was walking around the corner when a tall, tired looking man in his 40s to late 50s came up to me and asked to tie my laces. I assumed that he was Indian from what I could tell at the time. He spoke with an accent and I think maybe English wasn't his first language. I thought it was strange, but I let him, not knowing any better. After he was finished, he stared at me for a moment. He looked at the bruise on my arm, grabbed my arm and examined it. Oh no, you need a bandage. Come with me and we'll find your parents. Hearing this and becoming uncomfortable, my shy young self mumbled, It's fine. He pulled out his phone and brought up pictures of his son while still grabbing onto me. I was becoming increasingly freaked out, especially because I was very introverted when I was young. This is my son, you can trust me, he said. At that point, I knew something didn't feel right. I had a feeling that I had to leave as soon as possible. He was standing in the direction of my house, blocking the way, so running home wasn't an option. I also was smart enough not to show him where I lived. A few people were walking past, without intervening. My parents never taught me strange danger, so all I could do was hope someone intervened. A family walked by, going into the house from behind where the man was holding me by my arm. What makes me angry to this day is that no one intervened. Not even the family walking behind me. I kept repeating, it's fine, really it's fine, over and over, but no one spoke up. My heart was beating fast and I didn't know what to do. 
And I pulled my arm away and started walking to the food place as it was my only option. I didn't look behind me, I just kept walking. When I got to the food place, which took about five minutes, I ordered my milkshake and waited for it to be made. I was almost in tears, barely holding it together. The man had followed me all the way to the small food place. He was standing at the open entrance, staring at me. I really felt like I was about to be kidnapped. My heart was racing, I was sweating, and I was in shock. I did my best to hide my trembling voice when giving the cashier a thank you, and reluctantly took my milkshake. Hey, OP, a voice behind me said. I turned around to see my neighbour. She was a woman in her 60s, and was very nice from our select few interactions. I didn't know her that well, but my parents did. She whispered to me, Is that man following you? Do you want me to walk you home? Looking back now, she quite possibly saved me from being kidnapped. even saved my life. The man was scared off at that point and walked away. My neighbour walked me home and asked me a few questions. I answered slowly, trying to gather my thoughts and catch my breath. When we were nearly at my house, my neighbour asked if she should come in with me to tell my parents. I said no as I was in shock, and I especially didn't want my parents to find out, fearing they would get really mad at me. My parents were home at that point and greeted me as I came inside. I said hello quietly and rushed to my room. I sat on my bed and recounted what happened over and over. Would the neighbour tell my parents anyway? I hesitated for a while, then went up to my mum's room while she was watching TV. I asked if I could tell her something and she turned off the TV. I was halfway through explaining what happened when I broke down in tears. She got very mad and I immediately thought telling her was a bad idea. She rushed me downstairs to where my dad and three of my brothers were watching a movie together. My mum explained what happened and everyone got really mad. My dad was shouting at me, frantically asking questions. After answering, I went to my room and sobbed in my bed before falling asleep. I found out later that my parents went to the police station. My parents explained later that they weren't mad at me, they were mad at my attempt to kidnap her. The situation could have been handled a lot better by everyone looking back. I had to describe to my dad what he looked like, and I went to the police station to give a statement the next day. My neighbour also made a statement. My mum had a therapist come to the house for a day to find out if I'd suffered anything that could cause trauma. Luckily I didn't, but I was afraid to leave my house alone for months. I will always remember that day. They never called the guy. Maybe he was worried that a 7-10 to 10 year old was walking without parents and wasn't causing any harm. Looking back, my opinions have changed. I'd like to hear what you all think. I've been living in Prague for about a year. I taught third grade at a bilingual school during the day and worked off security for a tourist bar at night. Weekends, I would get off work around 3 or 4, depending on how busy it was. At which point, I would take the tram from the city centre to the JZP where my apartment was located. At the time, I was 22 years old and had short black hair with round glasses. And this is important. One night, I stood at the back of the tram with headphones in, despite my phone being dead. They were like a security blanket to prevent me from socialising with drunk English speakers that populated the city centre at that time of night. This group of seven guys looking to be between 25 to 30 get on being loud and drunk. I'm okay with accents, and these guys were definitely British, probably there for a stag do. I ignore them until I hear this conversation. I'd F that Harry Potter looking girl. <laughs> like she'd F you, mate. Like I'd give her a choice, and then raucous laughter and high-fiving all over this little joke. How can you tell that's a girl? One way to find out isn't there, and then more laughter. I keep staring at my Kindle and acting like I couldn't hear them and I didn't speak English, but internally I was screaming in panic. My stop was only two away and I figured I'd want to be as close to my flight as possible when I got off. So I sit there, ignoring and leering until the tram gets to my stop. I get off. I've got three blocks up and half a block over to get to my flat. They get off. That's fine, I live two blocks away from a very popular club and quite a few bars and hotels in the area. I rationalised to myself, they're not following me. I had a test, a stupid thing I did to see if people were walking behind me or were following me, and I crossed at weird places in the street, and they crossed too. I pick up my pace to be walking fast but not running. Their pace picks up and laughter emanates from the group behind me. I refuse to look back. I make the free blocks of them steadily closing the gap to me. I turn left and bolt, running as fast as I can, 
keychain with rock in my palm and building a key between my thumb and point and knuckle. I slam the door and even though it locks automatically and doesn't have a turntable handle, I throw the deadbolt and continue running to my flat where I also turn the deadbolt. I get to my room which faces the street and I curl up in the corner shaking as through my window I can hear, where'd that bitch go? Along with other things I'm not going to post. About 50 minutes later I hear them go away. So yeah, you group of British boys, I won't even call you men, let's not me. Edit, thank you for the responses. Unfortunately, this isn't my only unfortunate story of this nature. I appreciate all the people standing by me. Hi guys, I just wanted to add something really quickly at the end of this video. Some of you have been wondering why I haven't been uploading as much recently, but honestly it's just due to the fact that I've been so busy. I'm hoping in the next week or so I'm going to have a lot more time so I'm going to be able to record more. I've just not had the time at all. I'm planning on making more um, more videos like the last one on Amelia Earhart and uh, obviously doing more narrations, but for now this video just consists of my favourite stories from the last I think the last six months so if you like it then please let me know and I will definitely be doing some recording soon I've just been so busy and I want to let you guys you guys know that so um yeah thanks for watching as always please check out the charity of the month I really think it's a great cause and yeah see you all soon